You're listening to a classic business podcast as heard on Classic 1027. 1027. This is the Classic Business Retirement Feature. Now, COVID-19 has given you a chance to change your living annuity drawdown rate. If you're currently a pensioner with a living annuity, the question is, should you take it? Individuals who receive funds from a living annuity will temporarily be allowed to either increase up to a maximum of 20% from 17.5% or decrease down to a minimum of half a percent from 2.5%. The proportion that they receive as annuity income, instead of waiting up to one year, until their next contract anniversary date. And it's obviously done to assist people who either need cash flow immediately or who don't want to be forced to sell after their investments have underperformed. Mark McSimon, Wealth Manager at Private Client Holdings and a previous winner of the FBI's Financial Planner of the Year title is on the line. Mark, when do the changes take effect? Uh, good evening, uh, Marcus. Thank you very much for having me. Um, the changes um, take effect um, from the 1st of June uh, to the 30th of September. And the notice was in fact signed by the Minister of Finance uh, yesterday morning. So it's, it's a one-stop change allowable for a period of four months. And what it also changed is that previously when living annuitants had a living annuity with a value of less than 75,000 um, of 75,000 or less, um, they could take the full amount according to the less punitive retirement tax tables. Now, this amount of 75,000 increases to 125,000. My understanding when reading the government notice is that this amount um, will remain in place even after the 30th of September. And if you make a change, how does that impact the anniversary date of that living annuity? Does that then reset it in effect? No, not at all. So the anniversary date won't be affected at all. It's a special dispensation where after the 30th of September, the annuitant will default back to his or her original withdrawal instruction and so by implication the minimum and maximum will return to the original limits after the 30th of september so from 0.5 to back to 0.2 and a half and 20 back to 17 and a half so i think it raises two key issues and the first is that just because an annuitant can make a change to adjust um, their income drawdown over the next four months it doesn't mean that the annuitant should do so it should be an absolute act of last resort based on careful budget analysis and, and cost-cutting exercise where possible. Also, at the same time, you know, who should respond? And at present, there are those annuitants who are, are drawing down at, at the minimum, 2.5%, who don't require their income. In those instances, it would be helpful to withdraw to the minimum of, of, of 0.5%. 0.5, yeah. There'll be tax-saving implications, um, uh, which is helpful. But there are many pensioners out there who supplement their income from other sources of, of income. And one thinks of rental properties, um, many pensioners would have Airbnb, uh, flatlets, um, potentially holiday homes, um, involved in small businesses. And in this environment, a lot of those incomes may have dried up. And they're left with a living annuity uh, income that is insufficient to meet their ongoing monthly income requirements. And this particular initiative will help release some pressure for those individuals who rely on other sources of income. Now, obviously, there's a risk, though, if you increase your drawdown to 20% from the 17.5%, uh, that if you leave it at that level for too long, you're just going to burn through your capital. Uh, um, should, should you be looking at your asset allocation if, uh, if you change the drawdown? And, and if so, how? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. The reality is that, you know, annuitants are considering increasing their drawdown, you know, to the figure of 20% um, and continue with that uh, drawdown. The reality is it's simply not sustainable. The annuity simply can't handle that le- level of drawdown. And, um, yeah, the risk is complete uh, termination of the, of, of the annuity after I get a, a five- to eight-year period. Um, but that's really not how living annuities um, have been designed. Living annuities where the annuitant undertakes longevity risk, um, it's not the, uh, the insurer in the way of, of, uh, of life annuities that takes, um, uh, I guess, the risk of uh, the longevity of the insured, but it's rather the annuitant that takes on longevity risk. And we know through, uh, uh, you know, living annuities have been around for 30 odd years, we know that these instruments need to be treated with special care, extremely sensitive, and they need to be managed mm. properly. Mm. But you asked the question about should the asset allocation uh, of the living annuity be changed? 
um, if a person increases their drawdown. And, and yes, I mean, it could be, it could be the case. But there's no simple answer to that question. I think it's a matter of degree. It all depends on how big or small the increase uh, in drawdown is, whether or not the inheritance is following potentially a bucket strategy. And if that inheritance is, you know, withdrawn uh, exposure to income producing or high yielding uh, assets or, or funds, then they may uh, be the need to readdress the overall asset allocation of the living inheritance. Alternatively, if the inheritance is drawn down proportionately across all funds, um, it may not need to, uh, uh, one may not need to readdress um, the entire asset allocation of the, of the living annuity. But the key activities, I think, during this time, and certainly recently, uh, especially when markets have softened, is to ensure that, that, uh, that individuals avoid exchanging growth assets and income producing assets. Because really what this does is it, is it locks in permanent losses of capital. Mm. And there are a lot of moving parts when, when, when making decisions about whether or not to increase or decrease um, uh, the drawdown on a living in your team. You've got to consider total assets, onshore, offshore. One needs to consider whether there's any discretionary assets available. What expected cash flows? And I know from an expected cash flow point of view, it's a question of how long is a piece of string. I mean, there's so much uncertainty um, around lockdown and how, how long lockdowns will persist um, and when that will translate into uh, increased earnings flows, whether it be through small business practices or rental income. There's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. But the important, I guess the important fact here is that when decisions around living in URT is already made, it's critical to be working with a CFP professional. You know, these individuals, you know, have the, have the right amount of experience. They have the latitude with working with families where they understand certain actions that, that, that will work and certain actions that won't. These individuals have, um, have the right qualifications, the highest qualifications. They passed the stringent FBI board examination, um, um, uh, sort of signed the FBI code of, code of ethics. And when making these type of decisions, I really urge um, the holders of living in URTs to engage with CFP professionals. Many listeners will be already working with CFP professionals, but those that aren't, yeah. I would urge to do so. Absolutely. Otherwise, uh, you potentially lock in a uh, quite disastrous uh, bad choice or bad decision if uh, you do make one. Mark McSimon, Wealth Manager, Private Client Holdings, with some uh, excellent advice and insight into the recent uh, changes to the drawdown rates that have been introduced by Treasury, signed, as he said yesterday, by the Finance Minister, taking effect on the 1st of June.